of all the great ships to be found across the galaxy, none are granted such boundless purpose as those that bear the flag of the United Federation of Planets. Like their crews and captains, these vessels are expected to be equally suited towards exploration, research, diplomacy, commerce, and when necessary, war. Compared to the exploratory cruisers of the Federation, even the most capable warships of the other powers of the galaxy are reduced to dull instruments of limited ambition. Yet, even among Starfleet Command's legendary roster of vessels, of all the triumphant designs ever to be put into service, the success of one alone has exemplified the spirit and purpose of the Federation like no other. There are certain names that history will never forget, but a special place will always be reserved for the Galaxy Class. As an exploratory cruiser, the Galaxy Class was a multi-role vessel intended to operate independently for extended periods of time. It was the latest in an honored lineage of such vessels, stretching back to before even the founding of the Federation. They were deployed far from friendly ports, expanding the boundaries of the frontier and fulfilling Starfleet's oldest mandate, to seek out new life and new civilizations. At a length of 642.5 meters and a mass of 4.5 million metric tons, ships of the Galaxy class were amongst the largest ever put into service by Starfleet Command. 1,012 officers and enlisted personnel served aboard the vessel, and a further 200 visitors could be comfortably accommodated within various guest staterooms or quarters. Its evacuation limit was roughly 15,000 people, although this was only possible for a limited duration. Its design utilized the same basic structure that had defined Starfleet's exploratory cruisers since the days of the NX-01 class. Its primary hull was known as the saucer section, named for its roughly oval shape, and housed much of the vessel's living quarters and various crew support systems. Its secondary hull, sometimes referred to as the star drive section, was dedicated towards engineering and featured two warp nacelles supported by curved pylons. This physical arrangement separated potentially dangerous systems from the majority of the ship's crew. In the event of catastrophic damage to the warp core or other emergencies, the two hulls could be detached and separated. In such a situation, the saucer section could serve as a kind of lifeboat while maintaining its vital systems. Both the primary and secondary hull were capable of operating independently for long periods of time and as a consequence featured many duplicate and redundant systems within them. When the emergency situation had been resolved, the two sections could then be reconnected together. To enable the ship to perform the long-range, high-endurance missions for which it was designed, the Galaxy class was outfitted with the most advanced and powerful warp core of the era. The fastest ship in Starfleet at the time of its introduction, the vessel could maintain an average cruise velocity of warp 6 and a maximum sustainable speed of warp 9.2. During emergencies, this could be extended to warp 9.6 and potentially even a velocity of warp 9.8, albeit with extreme risk. Sublight speeds were provided by three impulse engines, two located on the saucer and one on the star drive section, allowing each hull to move independently during separation. Both the warp core and impulse engines would be heavily modified by their individual crews and during periodic fleet-wide standardized refits. The tactical subsystems of the Galaxy class were similarly advanced and based around 12 phaser banks distributed across arrays on various points of both hulls. Multiple phaser beams could be fired simultaneously from a single array with the power and duration of the beam manually or automatically controlled. The phasers aboard the Galaxy class starship were particularly adaptable, able to cut through a mile of solid bedrock in mere seconds or serving as merely a tactical rangefinder. In addition to its phases, fore and aft mounted torpedo launchers were located on the engineering section. Each launcher could fire up to five torpedoes simultaneously, with each torpedo capable of independent targeting and yield specifications. In addition to the standard 250 photon torpedoes typically carried aboard the Galaxy class, these launchers could fire antimatter mines, automated probes, or other such devices. Early tactical doctrine for Galaxy-class starships called for its two hulls to be separated at the start of hostile action. Non-essential crew, civilian families, or passengers were to be evacuated to the saucer section or to crash stations within the secondary hull. Command of the engineering section would then be transferred to the battle bridge, 
a specialized command center from which tactical control of the ship could be maintained. The saucer section would be free to withdraw or support the star drive section as the situation dictated. In most engagements, however, it was impractical to separate the ship during combat, and the use of such a tactic fell out of favor with most Galaxy-class captains. During wartime or periods of heightened alert, civilian families and non-essential personnel would instead be evacuated before the ship was deployed. Defense elements aboard the class included a navigational deflector dish mounted on the prow of the engineering section. Its use was mostly passive, utilized to protect the ship from small debris fields, asteroids, and microscopic particles that could be dangerous to the ship when traveling at warp. Against direct attacks, the Galaxy class was equipped with a high-capacity deflector shield. Like the phaser arrays, this could be quickly modified, rotating through various frequencies to allow certain types of matter or energy to pass through, or more effectively block others. In addition to these offensive and defensive systems, the class also carried the tractor beams, advanced sensor suites, and countermeasure systems standard across Federation starships. While all these systems together made the ship one of the most heavily armed and armored in local space, rivaling even the dedicated warships of the Romulan Star Empire or Imperial Klingon Empire, the true strength of the Galaxy class was its adaptability. Nearly every major tactical system could be heavily modified, completely transforming the ship's capabilities. In the hands of a qualified engineering team, even the deflector dish could be used as an offensive weapon, or the phaser arrays employed as an engineering or even medical tool. To enable the efficient command and control over these systems, the interior of the Galaxy class was equally advanced. The bridge, located at the peak of the saucer section on Deck 1, was the primary operational center. Its design was typical of a Federation starship, inheriting many of the advancements and features of the earlier NX and Constitution class starships. Central to the bridge was the command area, in which the captain was flanked by their first officer and an additional officer at the captain's discretion. Ahead were the operations and con stations, as well as the ship's view screen, which dominated the entire room. Behind the command area were the tactical, science, propulsion, environmental, and engineering stations. Every station was completely customizable and might be changed at the judgment of the captain or as a situation or mission might require. It was essential that access to the most critical areas of the rest of the ship were maintained from the bridge, and so the design of the Galaxy class housed several dedicated turbo lifts. Other features included an attached observation lounge and a ready room for the ship's captain, a meeting place for the ship's senior staff, and a private office, respectively. In the event the ship were incapacitated, the bridge included many redundant power backups, environmental systems, and even food replicators, so the bridge crew might continue to work, even if access to the rest of the ship were cut off. Second only to the bridge in importance was main engineering, spanning 12 decks of the secondary hull. From here, the warp core was directly monitored and routinely accessed along with numerous engineering support systems. Central to the room, in a similar arrangement to the bridge's view screen, was a master situation monitor, which typically provided a cutaway overview of the ship's operational status. This was further supplemented by a display table, often focused on a particular system, objective, or task. As part of the many redundancies present in the design of the Galaxy class, main engineering could also serve as a complete backup of the command bridge were it disabled or destroyed. Likewise, in the event of a warp core breach or other critical failure, the entire section could be sealed with isolated doors and force fields. To enable the uninterrupted deployment of the starship, every major section of the Galaxy class featured the same level of sophistication, redundancy, and flexibility as found on the bridge or within engineering. Its medical facilities in many ways resembled a terrestrial hospital, equipped not only to handle the types of injuries typical on a starship, but also major surgeries, long-term recoveries, and advanced medical research. Four medical laboratories could be dedicated to specific research, supplementing the ship's already considerable scientific facilities. Over 100 multipurpose labs were located across the Galaxy class. Most of these were relatively short-term centers and few remained under the same discipline of science for more than six months. They were highly modular and shared the same design, while only a few maintained extremely specialized equipment. Among the latter were the ship's cybernetics lab, 
an arboreum which doubled as a social area, and the cetacean labs which housed a myriad of aquatic species and crew. Other dedicated facilities included stellar cartography, projecting a vast three-dimensional display that assisted in navigational plotting and planetary surveys. Various transport and cargo bays made up the more utilitarian components of the Galaxy class. Twenty transporter rooms were spread across the vessel, and three shuttle bays supported many varieties of smaller craft. The largest of these was located in the saucer section, and served as the principal physical method of entering the ship. Five auxiliary hangars were also located across each hull, storing additional shuttlecraft and other vehicles. Among these was the captain's yacht. Maintaining crew morale and comfort over potentially multi-year missions was a major priority of the Galaxy class, and it featured many diverse amenities. First among these were the unusually spacious crew quarters. The captain, senior officers, and visiting VIPs all enjoyed private cabins, featuring a living area, separate bedroom, and bathroom. Most officers and even junior personnel enjoyed similar private accommodations, with only ensigns and enlisted personnel required to share. Further amenities included a large array of social and recreational facilities. The forward section of Deck 10 was often the center of off-duty gatherings aboard Galaxy-class vessels, typically arranged as a lounge with various beverages, food replicators, and games. These spaces were often named by the crew of the ship or at the discretion of the captain. Onboard holodecks were routinely used for recreational purposes, allowing the crew to take part in fictional narratives, engage in extreme sports, or training purposes. Additional gymnasiums, theatres, and concert venues were likewise aboard the ship, for when a more realistic method of exercise was desired. These were made available to the spouses and children of the ship's crew, with the latter even able to attend school. On launch, the starships of the Galaxy class were the most technologically sophisticated and complex vessels ever built by the United Federation of Planets. Their design and development took place across a multitude of worlds and included many of the Federation's most brilliant minds. The Galaxy-class Starship Development Project, headquartered on the Utopia Planitia Fleet Yards, utilized the research and engineering methods of dozens of different Federation species and federal research departments. The theoretical propulsion group in particular was credited with overcoming many of the class's matter-antimatter reactor challenges. While an innovative and transformative design, the Galaxy class was still in many ways the successor to the earlier Ambassador and Excelsior class vessels. Indeed, many of the systems ultimately used aboard the Galaxy would be first tested on these earlier starships. The first six hulls of the Galaxy class were constructed both in orbit and on the surface of Mars, reaching completion in 2364. Service aboard these ships was considered an extremely prestigious assignment, and their initial captains and crews represented some of Starfleet's finest officers. Once deployed, their immense capabilities were respected both within the Federation and even by its major rivals. During periods of heightened tensions, Galaxy-class ships would be specifically deployed to ward off the provocations of the Romulans, Cardassians, and other smaller regional powers. The ship's luxurious amenities also allowed them to serve as mobile embassies, hosting delegations from neighboring states, brokering treaties, and presenting conferences. Despite the diplomatic, cultural, economic, and scientific advancements these ships made possible, the class suffered an early tragedy when the USS Yamato was lost with all hands. Yet the most prominent Galaxy-class starship was the Federation flagship, the USS Enterprise D. From its acceptance into the fleet to the ship's eventual destruction eight years later by Klingon renegades, the Enterprise fell under the command of Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Among its many accomplishments were its dozens of first contact missions and the decisive role the ship played in preventing the assimilation of Earth by the Borg in 2367. The discovery in 2369 of a stable wormhole in the Bajoran system brought the Federation into contact with the immensely powerful Dominion. The USS Odyssey, a Galaxy-class starship, was involved in the disastrous first contact that ended in the ship's destruction. By the outbreak of open war in 2373, Galaxy-class vessels, now in full production, made up the backbone of Starfleet battlegroups. Many of these wartime vessels featured thorough modifications aimed at countering Dominion tactics and technology. 
Additional phaser arrays were the most common change from the initial production line, but as the war progressed, these alterations became more comprehensive. Amidst growing losses to the Dominion and a desperation for new hulls, many wartime-era Galaxy-class vessels were rushed off the assembly line, lacking their typical scientific or diplomatic facilities, and deployed to frontline fleets with 65% of their space frame empty. These ships played a central role in the Dominion War, taking part in every major engagement. During the largest fleet actions, ships of the class were organized into galaxy wings and tasked with breaking through the heaviest formations of Dominion, Cardassian, and later Breen war fleets. The class successfully performed a number of missions, attacking Dominion fleets, supporting planetary landings, enforcing blockades, and transporting troops. Their most critical role, however, was as command ships, utilizing their advanced sensor suites to coordinate the actions of entire battle groups. With the successful end of the Dominion War, the Galaxy-class starships were slowly assigned back to their peacetime missions. By the late 2370s, they had become a common sight across Federation space, once again performing the role for which they had been designed. An argument can be easily made that the Galaxy-class was the most significant starship in Starfleet history. Their consistently outstanding performance and distinguished achievements in every field of service elevated the class from mere starships to focused expressions of Federation ideals. On thousands of worlds, both inside the United Federation of Planets and far past its boundaries, trillions of people today live better lives as a direct result of these starships. The Galaxy class has overcome dangerous anomalies, they have unlocked vast new expanses of space for exploration and commerce, they have opened borders and stopped the march of armies. But above all, they have embraced the legacy of their forebearers and boldly gone where none have gone before. In Arsenal, the Templin Institute investigates the weapons, vehicles, and other constructs from across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards.